In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Hit my mic there. If you've been watching since the beginning of the show, you remember that what we started out on are a couple of articles of people that are skeptics of religion, skeptics of conservatism. And one of the things that they brought up is essentially this kind of mentality. Didn't outright say it, but they talked about essentially religion as something, it's just a bunch of people that don't question things that they don't want to hear alternate points of view, they're afraid. That That's kind of the picture that was brought up, especially by John Archibald, but, but by Kyle Whitmire is too, basically suggesting that because people are nostalgic and old-timey and they, they like their religion, they're afraid of things that are coming about, like drag queens on the Christmas parade and, and things of that nature. But here's the thing. That could not be further from the truth. You see... When it comes to Christianity, or Judaism, same God of, of Christianity is the God of Judaism, same God in the Old Testament and, and the New Testament, he actually encourages questioning. Not just questioning, bold questioning. And one of the best examples of that actually happens in the book of Job. Now to understand where we are when we pick up with this verse in the book of Job, Job has spent not all, but a pretty good chunk of this book questioning God. Now, most of us are very familiar with the story of Job. Very rich man, very wealthy man, had a lot of material and spiritual blessings, and pretty much all of them were taken away from him in a 24-hour period. And so Job is depressed and broken and sorrowful, and he does not understand why this is happening to him. Which, I mean, who can blame him? You look at what has happened to Job and how he's lived a good life, praised God, done everything he could to be a righteous person, and yet God seems to have abandoned him. It almost feels like God doesn't care about him anymore, and he's not willing to help him. And Job is understandably distraught. So what he does is he calls out to God and, and tries to find understanding. And what happens when God does answer him? He's pretty stern, but it doesn't seem as though he's mad at Job's questioning. In fact, and this is the verse that we're going to look at, the exact opposite is true. So let's look at Job 42 at the end of the book, Job 42, 7 through 8. It came about after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Elphaz, the uh, Tamarite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, because you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore, take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves, and my servant Job will pray for you. For I will accept him, so that I may not do with you according to your folly, because you have not spoken to me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now this is really interesting, because if you understand the story and the poetry of the book of Job, you know that Job has been spending most of this time questioning God, trying to figure out why these things are happening in his life the way that they are, and all of the friends, I mean, they have different arguments, but it basically boils down to, well, you've committed some kind of evil in your heart, you've committed some kind of sin, and God is punishing you because of that. It takes different forms, and, and the arguments are buried, but his three friends, that's really what it boils down to. And Job is just sitting there like, no, I, I really, I haven't done anything. I haven't committed any sin. This isn't the result of me doing something. And he's sitting there questioning God's motive. He's even, to a certain degree, it almost feels like he's questioning God's goodness. He doesn't go quite that far. 
But he's sitting there saying, God, I know you, I know who you are, I know that you're a God of righteousness and love and, and all these things, and I don't understand why I, your servant, who has always been loyal to you, why this is happening to me. And do you notice at the end of both those verses, because he says it twice, how he characterizes Job's treatment, Job's questioning? It's, you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. See, God's not upset with the questioning. God was never upset with the questioning. He was never upset with the honest questions that Job came forward and said, I don't understand God, I want answers. Job came to him countless times saying, this challenges what I know about you. It seems inconsistent. I'm having a hard time figuring it out. I need your help. Help me figure it out. God does come down on him in the sense that he's very abrupt and, and matter of fact with him. But he doesn't punish him. He's not mad at him. And in fact, at the end of all this, he asserts, no, what Job was saying about me was right. You see, God doesn't fear questions. God isn't afraid of the serious questions about our lives and about him that we ask. There are countless other examples about this. One that sticks out to me is that Moses, on the, the mountain, when he's talking to God through the burning bush, he asks all kinds of questions, and he has all kinds of insecurities. And it's not until Moses actually rebels and says, no, Lord, I'm just not going to do it. As long as Moses was just asking questions and good questions, God was fine with that, even if it seemed like Moses was trying to weasel out of it. It wasn't until rebellion actually set in that God started having a problem. And rebellion never set in with Job, and that's why Job and God never are at odds. You see, the God of the Bible, he wants us to question things. He wants us to question even him. The one thing that he will not tolerate is rebellion. That's a whole different thing. And if we want to be spoken of the way that Job is spoken of in this book, then it's fine that we question God, it's fine that we don't always get everything, we don't always understand, and Job understood that the way that he should go about this is to come before God humbly and say, there's some things that seem inconsistent that I'm trying to work out within my own soul. The very word Israel means to struggle against God, to struggle with God. And that's a struggle that is as old as man's relationship with God itself. We're not supposed to have all the answers or know everything right out. We're also not supposed to have blindfolded faith where we just believe everything God says and never question it. God wants us to have wisdom, and we can only do that by struggling with the difficult questions of life that he rightfully built us to try to learn about and be curious about and learn to handle. And if we are looking to somebody in the Bible to use as an example, with the exception of Jesus Christ, of course, there are very few people that even come close to measuring up to God's servant Job. Stay the course, friends. <laughs> Now, y'all know that I am a big believer in personal liberty, and that means I think that you should be free to decide for yourself whether or not you like this video and subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel. However, I will say this. You know who else never subscribed to my channel? Hitler. So the way I see it, you have two options. You can either like this video and subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel, or you can be like Hitler. Totally up to you.